Donald, let me review or remind you what we were talking about last time. Um, remember last time we spent actually most of our session discussing why are some things photoelectric and some things not. And in particular, why are oxides with D0 transition metals, why do they tend to be photoelectric and, and why do oxides with partially filled D shells on the transition metals tend not to be photoelectric? And we use perturbation theory to, to derive what we call the second order Yarn Teller effect that the energy of a material like a perovskite is a function of some distortion, say a photoelectric distortion, is the energy of the undistorted structure plus some first order correction, which is only non zero for centrosymmetric distortions and orbitally degenerate states. So this term actually that we ignored, we said this is not relevant for thoroelectrics. This is of course the term that's very relevant for the nickelates that um, Jan was just talking about. But for us what were important were these two second order terms. One which is always positive, which increases the energy, we want that to be small. And one which is negative, which lowers the energy, we want that to be large. And we said that for D0 systems, the energy raising term is small, the energy lowering term can be large, whereas for partially filled D shells it's the other way around. And we looked at the example of barium titanate, which is D0, the repulsive term is small, the energy lowering term is non-zero and large, and so barium titanate is thoroelectric. For calcium manganite it's the other way around, the repulsive term is large, the energy lowering term is zero by symmetry, where the denominator is small, and so calcium manganite is non Okay, any questions on that from last time? Okay, so then we went on to say, well, how can we make a multi if I can't have a transition metal that's both D0 to be ferroelectric and Dn partially occupied at the same time? And we went through a zoology of options. We said one can have a stereochemically active lone pair. One can use this trick of the geometry where you have a rotational mode of the kind that Philippe Gauzet talked about, which happens also to be polar. You can use charge ordering, and, um, and um, Jens alluded to this also in the case of the nickelates, where a combination of a kind of strange kind of charge ordering is also proposed to be, to be thoroelectric. Or you can have a magnetic spiral that breaks, breaks the inversion. Okay, then I left you with the homework. I said that, okay, most of these multi that we mentioned, and in fact I will argue that most materials that are interesting are transition metal oxides. And your homework was to think about why. Why are interesting materials made of, first of all, why do they have transition metals? And why are they oxides? Why are we not at a workshop for transition metal fluorides or for um, non-transfer calcium oxide? That would be, a, imagine we spent a whole week talking about calcium oxide. This would be a really, really not exciting two weeks. Not as exciting as it's been. So who did their homework? <laughs> this is really bad. <laughs> so, okay, we take five minutes. Um, we have to make a, to, those of you in the front turn around and talk to people behind you because if we discuss along a row, it won't work. If we go outside, we'll never come back. <laughs> so, um, and five minutes to discuss why transition metals. What's so interesting about transition metals? What's so interesting? What's so special about oxygen? Why is oxygen so special? And why, when we put them together, do we have all of this functionality? Do we have multi ferroism? Do we have metal insulated transitions? And so on. Okay, five minutes. And then every group should come up with one. <laughs> this is very important for you to articulate to your dean or to your funding agency why all the money should go to your research. And why <laughs>
prepared on what you do and why you should. It's really important that you do this. And then when you meet someone in the elevator, and you can tell, I work on transition metal oxides because. Maybe, um, so. maybe can we also find that uh, they ferro the radiation into oxygen, so then they also ferro into these and ask the ferro. Yeah, so the hybridization, so that, that's also what I have, <coughs> for me is the most important point. So here's my list. Um, so why do we want to work on oxides? Um, we mentioned already that they're not toxic. Right? Generally, they're not toxic. They're stable. Your rust is already oxidized, right? It's already rust. So they, they don't, they tend, they tend to be stable. They're already, they're already oxidized. They're abundant. Here's a um, chart of the abundance of the elements. Sorry, it's got a bit blurry. For 10 to the 6 atoms of silicon, anything above 1 is considered to be kind of acceptable in terms of, um, in terms of um, applications. And oxygen, of course, is the, well, it's the most abundant element on the planet. Also, the transition metals are all rather abundant. So, um, so in terms of abundance, this is, this is um, not a problem. Oxygen, I think, also is chemically really special. If you think about, to the left of oxygen in the periodic table, 
you've got nitrogen. And does anyone have a favourite nitride? <laughs> gallium nitride, yeah, that's my favourite nitride. What about the bonding of gallium nitride? The chemical bonding. Ionic, covalent? Covalent, covalent. it's very, very covalent. Gallium nitride is a wonderful covalent semiconductor that's completely non-functional. It, it's, it's very covalently bonded and that's what it does, right? What about to the right of oxygen? The periodic table. Fluorine. fluorine. And fluorides, what kind of bonding do fluorides tend to make? Ionic. ionic. They're very stable ionic bonds. And oxygen's right in between. So the bonds that oxygen makes with transition metals, they're not ionic, they're not covalent. They're kind of sitting somewhere just in between. And as a result, they're they, they tend to be rather polarizable in the sense that they'll be responsive to electric fields, they can accommodate different valencies, different kinds of doping, and this is what's associated with the very good electric field response, photoelectric behavior or diathylene. <coughs> so oxygen is sitting really in a very sweet spot in the periodic table. So you go down to low oxygen to sulfur and selenium, and the bands get very broad, systems tend to become more metallic, and, and they're not quite in this, um, this kind of competing competition between the different kinds of kind of behavior. Then the transition metals, these strong correlations, the fact that the behavior of one electron explicitly is influencing the others, we believe to be um, to be a part of the co contributing to exotic superconductivity, to magnetoclosal magneto resistance, to unconventional magnetism, to metal insulated transitions, and so on. And then we mentioned also they have very diverse chemistries, um, not just the different atoms, but the different valences, very diverse structures and dimensionality. So we can make layered, we can make one-dimensional materials. Okay. Questions? Any, any, any others to add to the list? So multiferroics also, we have the magnetism from the, from the D electrons, and then we have, because we have the oxygen, we have this beautiful polarizability, which gives us good flow electric behavior. Okay, so I wanted to finish then, um, I promised yesterday that I'd go into a little more detail on the characterization of all of these multi, different kinds of multiferroics. I decided to focus a little bit and I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about the lone pair active multiferroics. I'd be happy to discuss these others um, at the, the breaks with anyone who's interested just in the interest of time because I also want to talk about um, the magnetoelectric effect. I know a lot of you have said specifically you want to think about um, how with an electric field I can modify the magnetism. So I want to save us some time to do that. So um, I'll focus a little bit on the lone pair active molecules. <coughs> okay, so the most dumb way, I think, of making a multiferroic, and I can say that because it's the approach that I took, <laughs> is to say, okay, my Transition metal cation can't really be both photoelectric and magnetic. It can be either D0 or Dn. But why don't I just take a structure where I can put in two different kinds of cations and have one of them be photoelectric and one of them be magnetic. So this is not um, particularly intelligent, but this is the, um, the approach that we took. And in the lone pair active photoelectrics, this is, here's my perovskite structure, then the small cation at the center of the oxygen octahedron, we let be magnetic. And the large cation at the A site at the corner, we make this one be ferroelectric. And the, I'd say, most successful multiferroic material that adopts this approach is bismuth ferrite, where um, the ion in the middle is magnetic, ion 3 plus, and the one on the corner is ferroelectric bismuth 3 plus. I said this, this was our first success. It's not the first one that we tried. We started actually this approach with bismuth manganite, um, which was a really good idea, but I think, but didn't work. It turned out it was, it's actually ferromagnetic, but it's anti ferroelectric. Um, but bismuth ferrite was really, I think I'd say, really became a success story. Okay, so what happens we met in, in bismuth ferrite, we mentioned this last time, is that the low pair of, on the bismuth, the pair of the bismuth 6s electrons is what we call stereochemically active. And so just like ammonia forms a dipole because it has a lone pair above the nitrogen and pushes away the hydrogens. Um, did somebody have a working pointer <coughs> again, please? 
Can I borrow your beautiful green one? I like the, the green one. Um, so bismuth iron oxide has the same chemistry as ammonia around the bismuth. And so these little, on the picture on the right there, the little yellow umbrellas. Thank you so much. This is a density functional calculation of the electronic structure of bismuth iron oxide, um, bismuth ferrite. And the 111 direction of the perovskite is in the up direction, which is the direction of the polarization. And these little yellow blobs here, these little umbrella shapes, these are the lone pairs on the, on the bismuths. So you see here, here, this is the electron density from the lone pair. Here's the positive bismuth cation. And these are all lined up through the, throughout the material. And this is what gives it its ferroelectric polarization. When you switch it, when you switch the ferroelectricity, the, um, the umbrella shapes go to, go to the other side. So this is just the same chemistry as ammonia. And I think that, um, I, I think that in Ramesh's lectures last week, I'm sure he talked a lot about bismuth iron oxide. The magnetism is from the 3D transition metal, the iron 3 plus, which is um, a good idea because it's the largest <coughs> possible magnetic moment that you can have. It's five four magnetons. Um, and, the, and the properties are, are, I'd say, half very favorable. So one both calculates and measures a very large polarization, 90 microcoulombs per square centimeter. I think when we first measured this, it was the largest polarization ever, um, ever known in a ferroelectric. This is from the orig very first um, um, original measurement of polarization versus electric field. This is a value of 60 microcoulombs per square centimeter because it's measured in the 100 direction, not in the 111 direction. Um, of course, the problem with bismuth iron oxide, and this is the problem with, I'd say, most insulating transition metal ox magnetic transition metal oxides, is that they're antiferromagnetic because of the super exchange interaction. And so rather than having a ferromagnetic ferroelectric, one has an antiferromagnetic ferroelectric, which is very strong. The antiferromagnetic super exchange between D5 iron is, is, is extremely strong. Um, so this was um, not optimal. Um, what saves bismuth ferrite a little bit is that there's a counting of the antiferromagnetic moments, which gives a small, weak ferromagnetism. And this has been exploited. Um, or, and this has been exploited, actually, to allow a, a magnetoelectric coupling. But it's not as desirable as having a um, really a ferromagnetic ferroelectric. Okay. I want to point out that. Um, these measurements of the ferroelectric polarization, as of this beautiful ferroelectric hysteresis, were really <coughs> enabled um, by massive improvements in synthesis. I don't know how many of you have seen this, this picture. This is the, um, an early crystal of bismuth iron oxide. So bismuth iron oxide had been studied before, but it was believed to be a really lousy ferroelectric. Um, nobody had been able to, to make good switching hysteresis loops. Um, you can see also that it doesn't look very promising it's kind of a dirty black material. It looks like it's a metal. Um, and this is because it's, this is the actually is the single crystals that are transparent, but this has a lot of in, impurities in it. And it also has um, really a lot of twin boundaries. This beautiful fern-like structure is because of ferroelastic twinning. So there's no way if one takes a, a, a platelet from, from this sample and tries to switch it, it it's clamped with all, with all the twins, and it leaks because of all of the, the defects of conductivity from the defects. Um, so in the 1980s, this was the best possible sample that was available. Um, <coughs> this is a high-resolution TEM image of one of Ramesh's films, 21st Century Bismuth Ferrite from Martin Russell at Emperor. And you can see that at least on the scale of this, this image, this is the bismuth atoms, so these are spaced four angstroms apart. The films are essentially perfect. So this, this development in, in synthesis um, enabled the um, identification of, of new Okay, questions? So let me move on to, so that I, I, I won't go through the details of the other mechanisms then for introducing unusual mechanisms for ferroelectricity and combining them with magnetism. I want to go back to um, the opposite way around and say, okay, let's take a conventional ferroelectric and think about how to make it magnetic. And this direction, I think, has not been addressed 
quite so much. I saw a couple of you had, um, had posters where you were trying to introduce magnetism into Siberian titanite and so on. This <coughs> direction is really ripe for explore, exploration. Take a conventional um, ferroelectric like barium titanate and think about, okay, how else could I make some magnetism? And I'm going to show you an example where the way that the magnetism was introduced was by using not transition metal D electrons and instead using um, lanthanide F electrons. So here was the idea. Um, barium titanate we know is a very good ferroelectric. <coughs> Europium titanate exists in the perovskite structure. Um, it's magnetic because of the europium 4F electrons, but it's not ferroelectric. So based on what we discussed yesterday, any thoughts about why europium titanate is not ferroelectric? Or would you expect it to be ferroelectric based on what we discussed yesterday? Oh, oh one other thing. Europium is divalent. It's europium 2 plus, so it's titanium 4 plus. Who would expect europium titanate to be ferroelectric? Okay, who, who would expect europium titanate to not be ferroelectric? Okay, who has no idea? <laughs> really? You guys, titanium 4 plus D0. Titanium 4 plus D0. Okay, let's try again. Who would expect europium titanate to be ferroelectric? <laughs> okay, good, we're doing it there. So, by the second order Yon Teller effect, we'd expect europium titanate to be ferroelectric. It's a D0 cation. <coughs> europium, though, it turns out that the radius, the ionic radius of europium 2 plus is about the same as strontium 2 plus. And remember, we discussed a little bit yes, yesterday that this second order Yon Teller effect is a competition. It's a competition between repulsion between the electron clouds as you push them together and the hybridization of the D0 um, titanium as it approaches the oxygen. And in strontium titanate, we said, well, the bond lengths of the lattice constant is just too small that the repulsion becomes too high. So it doesn't quite manage to be ferroelectric. <laughs> Same thing with europium titanate. The lattice constant is just a little bit too small, and europium titanate doesn't quite make it into being a ferroelectric. <laughs> but what we want to try and do is trick europium titanate into becoming ferroelectric, because we know that it's already magnetic. Um, it's not actually a very good magnet. It's an anti ferromagnet with an IL temperature of about 7 Kelvin, but at least it's a, it's a start. OK, so, this is, so it turns out this works. It's been done in two ways. So the first way is by using strain. So exactly the same as strontium titanate. So it turns out if you take European titanate film and you grow it on a dysprosium scandate substrate, which stretches it, then in plane, europium titanate thinks it's barium titanate. In plane, the lattice constant's gotten bigger, and now there's room for the titanium to be able to move off center. So this is very, very clever. This is not, not um, work that I was involved in at all. This was um, calculations from um, Karen Rabin and, and Craig Fenny, and the um, films were grown by, um, by Daryl Flom, and they were able to... Um, Verify. I'm not sure if they did ferroelectric switching or they verified with second harmonic generation, but it really is polar in plane. I'm not sure that they succeeded in switching it, but it definitely is in plane and polar. So this is very, very um, clever. <coughs> and this, of course, only allows it to be ferroelectric in the plane. Out of the plane, it's got smaller, the lattice constant, because you've stretched it in plane, so because of the Poisson's ratio, it's got smaller. So you can't have out of plane ferroelectricity with this combination. So the other way, though, that one could in principle make European titanate ferroelectric is just by, we just need to increase its lattice constant. If we can increase its lattice constant, then it should become ferroelectric. So we can apply negative pressure. And this we can do in the computer very easily. If I take European titanate and just stretch it in all directions, it becomes ferroelectric. But any thoughts on how we can do this in an experiment? Mm -hmm. In planting helium. In planting helium. Yeah. That could, I think, does it work? Well, we're trying to make it work now. Really? With your open titanate? No. <laughs> okay. But with, with, with what? STO and BTO. Oh, that would be really exciting. Helium and planted STO. Does it stay there? Yes, it's supposed to stay there. Ah, good. that would be really great. Okay, helium and planted European titanate. I really look forward to hearing about this. 
So, okay. What else could I implant, or what else could I put into europium titanate to make them pressure negative? Very. Very, yeah, or something big, right? If I could substitute something else big, I can make negative chemical pressure. So this is another possibility. And this we, this we <coughs> actually, um, well, we did it in our computer, and my colleague Stanislav um, Kamper from um, the Czech Institute in, in Prague did it experimentally. He made 50-50 um, europium barium titanate, and here's the um, dielectric data. So this is the um, dielectric permittivity as a function of temperature for different frequencies. <coughs> And this um, down diligence at about 200 Kelvin is the um, photoelectric transition. And in the inset, you see the, the polarization of hysteresis loops, rather nice hysteresis loops, um, that are rather um, that are strongly temperature dependent um, because the samples, these are ceramics and they're, they're quite, quite leaky. Um, but it really was photoelectric. Of course, once we start putting barium on the europium site, we start suppressing the magnetism. So the, the magnetic susceptibility um, shows the nail temperature is reduced to, to a little bit below 2 Kelvin. Actually, for this project, we wanted, to, um, we wanted to work at liquid helium temperature and not have magnetic ordering. So we actually designed for this also. But if we wanted to make it really a good magnet, this wouldn't be a good approach. But it was a way to make it thermoelectric. Okay, questions? Um, yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's in the past with the European. There are the stability at the gamma point, even if it's not to the stronger one. Is it stable or not? So European titanate, um, the bulk phonon band, when you calculate <coughs> for cubic European titanate, there's a very <coughs> strong rotational instability, I think at the R point and maybe also at the X point. Yeah. And there is um, a gamma point instability. I'm pretty sure there's a gamma point instability also from the qubit structure, but this goes away when you put in the rotation. Okay, yes, yeah. and, uh, in it's space, very close, though, like strontium titanate. It's very close. And in this case, the pattern of the distortion is now dominated also from the rocky one, it is only by the digital motion. Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah, so if you look at the distortion pattern of the soft mode, at least in the computer where we can calculate it, it has a very large europium off centering also. Because the europium is so small, it kind of rattles. So the europium, I think, is not doing anything chemically, it's just too little for its space, so it follows the titanium along. Yeah. Which was also very good. This was a, um, a project we were trying to design a material to measure the electric dipole moment of the electron. <coughs> This was very, very interesting. So it turns out the, the electron is predicted to have an electric dipole moment, and different um, kinds of high energy physics theories predict different values for this electron electric dipole moment based on how much CP violation they incorporate into their theories. So we thought, okay, we can try and measure this with a multiferroic, and um, one, of course, never measures it, but one says, okay, I've measured for so long and not found it, it has to be smaller than a certain value. And then based on that, one can exclude lots of, um, lots of um, theoreticians' favorite, or high-energy theoreticians' favorite theories. Um, so we needed a material that, that behaved really just like European bearing titanate. It didn't work in the end, it turned out, and the reason was quite subtle, um, because every time we made this hysteresis loop switching, the whole thing warmed up, and so um, the colleagues that were making the experiment were not able to control the cryogenics. So we don't have the world's most accurate measurement of the electric dipole moment of your yeah, so that, that was uh, very fun. I can show you one thing that we did get out of this project, though, was um, this was very interesting. If you work on high energy theory, people think you're much, a much more interesting person than if you work in condensed matter. And so our paper got, got featured in National Geographic and then wrote that the universe's existence may be explained by our new material. <laughs> a new material could help physicists explain the existence of matter such as this astronaut <laughs> scene. <laughs> <laughs> this was really up. Oh, I'm sorry. We're very, very excited. <laughs> yeah. this is, any of you think you're going into science writing? You have to be this creative. Not, to, not you know, the existence of matter such as this table. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any questions? 
So those of you who are working on trying to make conventional ferroelectrics magnetic, I think this is really an exciting direction. There's very little been done. So there's been some of it that I've shown you with introducing rare earth magnetism, which is always going to be low temperature. Um, but also thinking about, OK, how can I take barium titanate? Can I make it magnetic, for example, like a dilute magnetic semiconductor? Um, that kind of mechanism for magnetism. This is really still very open. <coughs> OK, so then the last. Um, 25 minutes or so, let me switch and talk about um, magnetoelectric response, and specifically the, the linear magnetoelectric effect, which is very much related to multiferronics. Um, so the definition of a linear magnetoelectric response is that the application of a magnetic field induces an electric polarization that's linear in the magnetic field. And vice versa, the application of an electric field induces a magnetization that's linear in the electric field. And this coupling um, between the electric and the magnetic components is called the magnetoelectric test. So a couple of things to notice, and, and this is where the link <coughs> comes with multiferroics, is that this magnetoelectric tensor can only be non-zero if your material doesn't have a center of inversion and it doesn't have time reversal. So it should be polar, and it should be magnetic, magnetically ordered. So of course, all multiferroics have the possibility of having a non-zero magnetoelectric tensor, at least for the, from this gross symmetry requirements. Not all of them are magnetoelectric, most of them are. The other thing about the magnetoelectric tensor is it's bounded by the product of the dielectric permittivity and the magnetic permeability. Right? So the electric field has to get itself <coughs> transmitted into the system somehow through the dielectric permeability, and then this has to get transferred, and then the magnetism manifests through the magnetic permeability. So one would like both of these properties um, to be large. And of course, in a multiferroic, where you're close to a ferroelectric phase transition and a magnetic phase transition, where you can be, then you have the option of both of these, these being large. There's a very nice review from um, Manfred Kindick, who you heard about last week. Um, on the revival of the magnetoelectric effect. How much did Manfred talk about magnetoelectrics? He did? He did. He did? OK. So if I'm repeating myself, <laughs> let me know. Um, a little bit of, um, if I'm repeating him, I guess I'm not repeating myself. <laughs> OK, a little bit of history of um, magnetoelectrics. So if you do a web of science, I know maybe Manfred showed this also. If you make a web of science search of the number of publications per year, and you search for magnetoelectric star, it kind of is hovering about five. Um, there was a little blip up to about 12 or 15 in 1970 because there was a conference organized here on magnetoelectrics. Um, and so all of a sudden, people got interested. <laughs> <laughs> about, about five people got interested in some conference. <laughs> um, the first reference that I've managed to find to magnetoelectric is in the first edition, or the 1959 edition, this is actually, I think, in the English translation, it's 1960, um, of Landau and Lifshitz's Electrodynamics of Continuous Media. <clears throat> and it's in the section on um, piezoelectrics. And they say, let us point out two more phenomena which in principle could exist. One is piezomagnetism, which consists of a linear coupling between a magnetic field and a solid and a deformation analogous to piezoelectricity. So if we go back to our multiferroics triangle we looked at yesterday, in 1959 they had this bit worked out already, right? They had kind of they had ferroelectricity and, and strain, and so they had piezoelectricity. They pointed out that piezomagnetism was a possibility. By symmetry it should exist. The other is a linear coupling between magnetic and electric fields in the media which would cause, for example, a magnetization proportional to an electric field. And both these phenomena could exist for certain classes of magnetocrystalline symmetry. We will not, however, discuss these phenomena in more detail because it seems that till present, presumably, they have not been observed in any substance. So this was in 1959 by Landau and Lipschitz. What's really remarkable is that one year later, <coughs> a material was identified, chromium-203, um, theoretically first by Igor Janoshinsky, who showed by symmetry arguments that the magnetoelectric effect should exist in chromium-203. And then the same year, about six months later, it was measured by Astrol. Um, and I think these, they were both... So Igor was actually, a, at the time, a PhD student of Landau, so I guess he got um, 
first dibs on the good problem. <laughs> oh, but he really showed that it was that it was possible that it was measured. So within a year of this, this statement being made. So that was very remarkable. And yeah, so then, so it was discovered. Um, there was a bit of work, a few papers a year. Um, there was this conference in the 1970s, and then I mean, there was some work continuing through the end of the last century in the former Soviet Union. And I think really just one advocate in Western Europe, which was Hans Schmidt, who was at the University of Geneva at the time and had really an active program on magnetoelectrics. His, his was the um, Christmas ferrite crystal I showed you, showed you <coughs> the stuff. But, Really nothing, nothing so much was, there was, I'd say, a lot of evidence and very clever people and they made it really remarkable pro progress, given that they really didn't have any materials. They didn't have any um, good quality materials that they could, that they, to, to, to work with. And so it was only really at the start of this century um, that the number of papers on, or the people were able to make progress on magnetoelectrics and the magnetoelectric effect because we started to have good multiferroic materials, multiferroic and magnetoelectric materials to work with. And again, there was two reasons for that. One is we started to understand how to make multiferroics. We understood the second Audion Teller effect and why D0 was a problem, why, why one needed D0 for, for electricity and not for magnetism. And um, we had good, good um, techniques for making good quality um, songs. So now it's really an active area. Okay, so that's a little bit of history for you. Any questions? All right, so then let's think about how, when I apply an electric field to a material, how can I change the magnetic properties? Because this is not at all obvious. When I apply an electric field, I think, okay, I move the electrons or I move the, the ions, but why is an electric field going to affect the the magnetism, particularly the spins. Let's, um, let's, so let's have a think about how that can happen. And let me show you, I think, the, the most um, intuitive mechanism, at least, at least for me, how I first started to think about the magnetoelectric response. So here's my little cartoon of a transition metal oxide. Um, this could be, say, I don't know, manganese, some manganese <coughs> oxide come down. And the positive ions of the transition metals and the negative white ions of the, of the oxygen. And I've chosen, I, just to, because it's easy to illustrate, I've made it to have kind of a, a hexagonal lattice. And my magnetic transition metal ions have a magnetic moment, so my arrows are my spins. And because of the usual super exchange interaction, these spins want to be anti-parallel to each other. So this angle is a triangular lattice, but this angle is pretty close to 180 degrees, so these would like to be anti-parallel. Of course, because it's a triangular lattice, they're not able to do that um, because of, there's not any way that three, three parallel spins can be anti-parallel to each other. And so instead they adopt this kind of 120 degree, they get as close as possible to being anti-parallel to each other. So this is my starting point. Um, no. Um, without any field of play. Does this have a center of inversion? Yes. Yes. <coughs> so here's my center. If I invert through this center, do I end up back to where I am or not? No, right? This atom goes down here, and it's very different. So it doesn't have a center of inversion. It breaks space inversion symmetry. Um, it's magnetically ordered, so it breaks time reversal symmetry. So I, I should expect by symmetry that I should have a magnetoelectric effect in, in, in this, um, this model compound. Okay, so what's going to happen to this when I apply an electric field? What's going to happen to the ions? I'm going to apply an electric field in the up direction. Where will my positively charged ions go? In the direction of the electric field. And my negatively charged ions in the opposite direction. Right, so let me apply an electric field, and my positive ions go up and my negative ions go down. So now my crystal has deformed, and here I've really exaggerated it, but look at what's happened to my bond angle. So this transition metal, oxygen transition metal, now is much closer to 180 degrees than it started, and this one, transition metal oxide, transition metal, oxygen transition metal, is now closer to 90 degrees, right? Just because of the deformation 
from applying the electric field to the positive and negative ions. And if you remember from your good enough Kanemuri rules that the 90 degree transition metal oxygen transition metal interaction is ferromagnetic. In many cases, of course, it's, uh, there are more, more subtleties, but usually 180 degree super exchange is anti ferromagnetic, 90 degree super exchange is ferromagnetic. Right? Questions? Objections? Okay, so now let's look at what happens to the, to the magnetic moment center, the spins. These guys now want to become more ferromagnetic because they're joined by a 90 degree interaction. So they're going to rotate downwards. That also makes them happier in their interaction with this guy, because this guy's up. And so by this super exchange interaction, they want to be down relative to this, this thing. So I end up with a final magnetic structure, two spins close to pointing down, and one spin close to pointing up. And so I've induced a magnetic moment. Right? So my electric field in the up direction has induced a magnetic moment, in this case, in the down direction. So for this particular symmetry, um, I've ended up with a magnetoelectric response. Remember my magnetoelectric, that alpha thing was a tensor. In this case, my magnetoelectric response is, is diagonal. It's, come, it's, it's parallel to the direction of the applied field. Questions? OK. Actually, let's do this as an exercise, because I think we have time. Take, take this structure, and instead of having <coughs> spins like this, we're going to assume it's a different kind of, um, you have a different anisotropy, and the spins are going to be, let's see if I can find the light. Left. Left one? Yes. Top middle. Top middle? Okay, another. Top right. 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 Now I'm going to assume that, that my, I have the same crystal structure, but now I have a different magnetic anisotropy. So my magnetic symmetry is going to change, and this time my spin is going to be like this. So still I have 120 degree anti ferromagnetic super exchange, but the anisotropy is such that instead of pointing out like a monopole, they go around like a, like a kind of toroidal, like a torus, like a toroidal node. Um, still, they're at 120 degrees to each other, so I've not changed the super exchange at all, but I've changed the magnetic anisotropy. And go through this same exercise yourselves. You may talk to your neighbors, not the people behind you. Apply an electric field. The ions are going to distort in the same way, and then think about, okay, how have my bond angles changed, and how are my spins going to rotate? And let's have a look at whether in this system, I get a magnetoelectric response, and which direction it goes. If anybody stuck, ask this guy. <laughs> so let's, it, let's the others have a try. Okay. So this is Is this obvious to everybody? Give people a minute. It's brilliant. <laughs>
Electric tensor. So the magnetic anisotropy um, has, has changed the, um, the magnetoelectric response. Notice that this mechanism, in fact, doesn't require any mediation by spin orbit coupling. It's entirely just through the Heisenberg exchange. So it's a rather strong mechanism. It's going to be a very strong effect. All the spin orbit coupling is doing is deciding whether I has, have this <coughs> magnetic symmetry or um, this magnetic symmetry, right, through either the, the um, single ion anisotropy or the Jamison Marie <laughs> interaction will just determine my, uh, my magnetic anisotropy. But then the mediation for the magnetoelectric response is directly through the super exchange. Okay, questions? So this is one. one? Yeah. Uh, in the triangle next to it, Mm -hmm. The current is going to be the other way around, so therefore the magnetic moment will be opposite. So, so this is so a really good question. If I just were now to pave my, um, my board by continuing this triangle kind of like this, um, then you're absolutely right. Then I would end up with a, another triangle that would be opposite, and I'd have the opposite response. Maybe you heard from Manfred Friedrich about a material that really has very close to that such a such a structure. It has planes of manganese oxygen with this um, triangular kind of symmetry. Yttrium manganite, or the, the rare earth hexagonal manganite. And that's exactly what happens. So they're very interesting. They break time reversal and space inversion symmetry, but they don't have a linear magnetoelectric response. They're anti magnetoelectric, in fact. And, and you can think of that. that in, so they have one kind of toroidal moment in this direction, but then in the next, Kind of unit cell, it's in the opposite direction. So you have to be a little bit careful. It's not the case that every anti-ferromagnetic or ferromagnetic ferroelectric will have a magnetoelectric response. It can be, I would say, well, you could say it still has a linear magnetoelectric response, but it's not Q is equal to zero. It's a zone boundary um, magnetoelectric response, if you like. It's an anti-magnetoelectric. So a, a, a Q equals zero, a, a, a uniform electric field will induce a zone boundary um, magnetism, or an anti magnetism in that case. How am I doing for time? I can show you another example, or we can just kind of wrap things up if I'm running out of time. Uh, you have another 10. Oh, OK. Ten. OK, then let me show you a an, an, completely another mechanism. <coughs> um, <coughs> which links in a little bit with some of the discussion you've been having about heterostructures and, um, and spintronic materials, and show you how you can get a magnetoelectric response at an interface. And so here the example I want to show you is um, to take a, a ferromagnetic material or some material that has some kind of magnetic ordering to lift the time inversion symmetry. And instead of worrying about my magnetic material having to um, be polar, to put in an interface to lift the space inversion symmetry. Right? So I can just take a regular ferromagnet, I can take iron if I like, um, and I put in an interface 
Actually, the interface will do two things here. It will lift the space inversion symmetry, and it also will make my system insulate and perpendicular to the interface. Because if I want to have a magnetoelectric response, um, I have to be insulating, otherwise my electric field is just going to conduct. It's not going to induce a magnetizing. And so um, I try a system to, to kind of test whether this will give me a magnetoelectric response that we used was heterostructures of strontium ruthenate, strontium titanate. So we did this, I'm going to show you, first of all, the computational results. Um, we chose this system because it's just very easy to build in the computer. Right, they, they lattice match, they're both perovskites. Um, also, from a, a practical point of view, strontium ruthenate is a ferromagnet, um, and strontium titanate has a very high dielectric response. So they have the right properties, but the motivation really for this <coughs> combination was ease of computation. And so then we built, in, in our computer, we made a heterostructure of strontium ruthenate with strontium titanate. This had periodic boundary conditions, so it's really infinitely re repeated. And we applied an electric field, in our, in the, again, in the, in the computer, in the calculation, and calculated what, what happened for this response. Okay. And what we found was um, exactly as, as, as we expected. So, so this is the change in the magnetization as the electric field is applied. Um, so spin density here should be change in spin density. Sorry. So the strontium ruthenate starts off ferromagnetic, and then this is now the change in the magnetization. And what we find is that deep in the strontium titanate, there's no magnetoelectric response, right? Because there's, no, there's nothing magnetic. Deep in the strontium ruthenate, there's also no magnetoelectric response because when you write in the strontium ruthenate, it doesn't really know that it's that it's the space inversion has been has been broken. But at the interface, then you get a large change in the magnetization. And I, I don't think I plotted this, but um, it's linear. It's a linear response. So if I would double the electric field, I get a double the amount of magnetism. Okay, and let me show you the mechanism. So those of you who are um, interested in spintronics, um, may be able to just um, see this right away. So, sorry, this is a really <laughs> color scheme, I think. I applied an electric field to my dielectric. Right? So this is my strontium titanate. I applied an electric field to it from the usual dielectric response of the strontium titanate. So remember, the electric field is always getting into the magnetoelectric first through its dielectric response. Then my strontium titanate polarizes and becomes positively charged at one side and negatively charged on the other. And in the metal, in order to screen this positive charge, electrons flow to the surface and they flow away from the surface over here. Right. So nothing exotic, just, a, just normal capacitive behavior. But now if my metal is ferromagnetic, so here I sketched the, the case of it being half metallic, just for ease of seeing what's going on. So it's, the Fermi energy is in the region of just one um, spin orientation. <coughs> then these extra electrons that flow to the surface here, at the surface, increase the magnetization. They all go into a band of one spin state. And the electrons that flow away from this side, they move out of the band of one spin state and they decrease the magnetization. <coughs> So here's another mechanism then that you can have a magnetoelectric response in the case where your system is metallic but with an insulating with a with an interface to an insulator by um, carrier mediation by the response of the electrons in the metal to the change in surface charge of the dielectric. Okay. So questions on that mechanism? Yep. Uh, has this behavior uh, is evolving with uh, the number of units of the two atoms? Oh, it actually it actually doesn't. Um, because provided that you've got enough, let me maybe show you on this picture. Provided that you've got enough that it gets to zero in the middle. So this is completely an interfacial effect. You need uh, a minimum amount of uh, sensor or And so we had, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, six units out, and then with less, you still the same effect. I'm oh, sorry? With less number of units out, you get some. With less? So if it doesn't get the chance to get to zero in the middle, then it starts getting perturbed at the interface. 
But if we put in more layers, we tested this, it just stays zero. And this, so this has been seen, I, I realized, I'm very sorry, I forgot to put in, the, it's a typical theory, so I forgot to put in the experimental data. Oh. So this is this seen uh, in two systems that I know of. One actually in this system using neutrons by Mike Fitzsimmons at Oak Ridge. He measured explicitly this behavior after we proposed it. And then also in um, ionic liquids, in um, basically an electrochemical cell made with an ionic liquid, um, where, the, where the dielectric was an ionic liquid, so they were able to apply extremely large large electric fields. Okay, so other questions for that mechanism? I'm sorry, I have yep. a question. Why, <coughs> why is there a spin density inside of the STO? Ah, oh, it's a very good question. So this spills over um, because of the interface, basically because of the chemistry between the titanium and the oxygen and the ruthenium. There's a spillover of electron density into the titanium the empty titanium D states, and because the ruthenium atom is spin polarized, it only has a, it has most the electrons of one spin type at the Fermi energy. These electrons that spill over onto this titanium are spin polarized also. Um, yeah. So this um, this is this line here. I guess it, yeah, it probably shows it disproportionately large because we've also also smoothed it. But there is. Um, I think probably at any dielectric capacitor interface, there's a little bit of spillage of, of the metallic charge into the first layer of the, of the capacitor, which I think is also maybe, um, this is, I think it's a little open question, um, partly responsible for this kind of dead layer behavior on the surface of a, of a capacitor. And it's just because here, the electrons on the strontium roof are spin polarized when they spill over into the strontium titanate. Okay, so let me wrap up then. Um, okay, I didn't really talk much about first principles calculations, but I'm going to just assert that first principles calculations are really useful for predicting magnetoelectric responses of heterostructures and bulk materials. I gave you one example. I've shown you some mechanisms. Um, magneto I showed you two mechanisms for magnetoelectric coupling, just looking at the exchange and um, this carrier mediated interfacial magnetoelectricity. And then I thought I'd, I'm going to finish with a story. Um, okay, about basically how <laughs> I got into multiferroics. So this is a kind of a um, personal personal interest angle. So, um, because I think maybe for, for all of you, multiferroics are just like this very standard thing. So oh, another multiferroic session at the APS. Um, so I want to try to convey to you a little bit of um, it's really how much really exciting it's been to be involved really in a kind of emerging field right from the very start, and how some of the things which seem really routine now, like bismuth ferrite, these were like tremendously exciting. We would argue, have fierce arguments all night at the MRS meeting about the properties of, of bismuth iron oxide. Um, and it was not, I mean, you know, 20 years ago might seem prehistoric to all of you, but it's not, you know, on the global scheme of things, it's not so long ago, really, is it Beatrice? Yeah. No. <laughs> she's, she's laughing, she agrees, it's not so long ago. So I was, um, I was a postdoc 20 years ago, so more or less, something like that. Um, and I went to work with um, Karen Ray, who some of you I know are working with, many of you know. At, uh, at the time, she was at, at Yale University. And she's an expert in ferroelectric materials. And I was interested at the time, actually, in um, colossal magnetoresistance in magnetic materials. And we had the <coughs> idea um, that the tools and methods that Karen had developed for first principle studies of ferroelectrics, we could apply to studying ferromagnetics because of the analogs between ferroelectrics and ferromagnetics. Um, and so it was really from a technical point of view, we, um, my, my plan had been to work on colossal magnetoresistive oxides, lamp and magnetite, using the kind of tools that Karen had developed. And it, for those of you who are doing electronic structure calculations, it's probably quite remarkable that at the time there were not, there was not the capability to do spin polarized pseudo potential calculations. This had not been developed. So I actually wrote the first spin polarized um, pseudo potential code so we could even calculate for magnetic systems. So there we were, um, working away on, um, with, with this idea. And, um, oops, sorry, I think that's it. And um, are any of you from Yale, actually? <coughs> So we would go to this coffee shop called Willoughby's in Yale University with the other postdocs in the group and kind of hang out. 
And one time we were there drinking coffee, and one of my colleagues said to me, you know, it's a pity there are no ferromagnetic ferroelectrics, because then we could have a proper co collaboration. And, and I'm like, that can't possibly be true. There must be some ferromagnetic ferroelectrics. Why on earth would there be no ferromagnetic ferroelectrics? And so I, this was kind of also before the days of online web searches. So I, I took home um, this encyclopedia of ferromagnetic materials. And this book at the time, this big book on ferroelectric materials, lines and glass. And I spent the weekend, there's not much to do in Connecticut, I have to say. So I spent the weekend <laughs> going through both of these books, thinking there's got to be a material that's in both of these books. This was my sophisticated literature search. And, um, <laughs> and there wasn't. There was not one material that existed in the, in the magnetic book and the ferroelectric book. And um, this then became, I'd say, perhaps an, an obsession for me to understand why, well, you know, what a dumb thing, how could there possibly not be any magnetic flowers? And so I decided that this was what I simply had to work on. And so when I moved to um, Santa Barbara um, soon after as an assistant professor, um, this is what, what I did. It was the kind of core of my research effort, I would say. Um, so, um, <clears throat> So I think the moral of the story is if you're a postdoc, drink coffee with your colleagues. You know, at the time I was a postdoc, I thought the most important thing I did was that I did my research well. It turned out absolutely not to be the case for my personal career. It was that I went for a coffee with one of my colleagues and we had these crazy ideas together. Um, figure out for yourself what's the absolutely most interesting question that you want to answer. And, and then answer it, however crazy it seems. Um, and this is me. This is, actually, this is from the... Um, science magazine artist. This is me not, it's, it's a little, um, I think, multi ferroic cloud <laughs> flying away over UC Santa Barbara, I guess, uh, over, to, um, over to Zurich to the ETH when I decided to, to move back, back to Europe. Okay, anyway, that's how it, that's for me how it all, all started, and it's been really a lot of fun. So I'd be happy to take any more questions, or I guess we move on to the next talk, or do you get another break now? Or? Oh, no, no more breaks. No, there's no more breaks. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>